expensive sugar-free candy that I got from Canada. This was 10 years ago when we couldn't get it at the drugstore. Mm -hmm. Ordered it off the internet. It cost like $2 a piece. And I said, this is what I... And he's like, oh, cool. And he took them all. Um, <laughs> but I eventually forgave him because he hired me on at his clinic about five years later when he was going to take the diet that he's been studying and implement it in a patient population. So I got to be there um, from ground zero when he open the doors to the clinic, in walk our first two patients, and he says, you know, I'm going to fix you, I'm going to fix you with food. And, um, and it was an amazing journey. So I got to watch as people got put on a low-carb diet, a diet that nobody else would recommend, and um, watched blood sugars get better, watched um, triglycerides and HDL, uh, dyslipidemias get better, blood pressure get better, and all of this before they'd lost a whole lot of weight. Um, you know, they would lose some weight, sure, weight, you know, low carb works for weight loss. But all of the other things were what really sucked me into this. Um, and I got just so excited about uh, what I was seeing that I decided to go back to school. So I'm in school right now, working on an MPH RD. I just got accepted to a PhD program to study nutrition epidemiology. Um, so I'm going to be, I hope, one of the first low carb researchers who looks at population studies with a different perspective. Because we know that in the public health field, we make policy guidelines based on pop population studies. But we also know that population studies and what we see in clinical populations, especially those of you who are low-carb RDs or docs, those are two very different things. And I want to be part of the group that puts that science, those two fields together. So. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about why I think you guys need to contribute time, money, resources to our group. Um, first of all, we do notice that something's going on out there in the world. So I'm going to read you a quote from one of our low-carb experts that could not be with us today. Um, and just bear with me. So here it is. Medical opinion is finally catching up with the vast weight of scientific evidence that supports a controlled carbohydrate nutritional approach. And what a godsend that is, because there was a time when well-meaning but poorly informed organizations were so fat phobic that people became convinced that so long as a food was low fat, it was healthy. People were taught to regard sugary cereals, which bore the American Heart Association seal of approval, as health food along with bread, pasta, bagels, and the like. We were taught to shrink in terror from steak or lamb chops. The low-fat craze significantly lowered the percentage of fat in the American diet, but simultaneously resulted in a massive increase in carbohydrate consumption. 
nor did the reduction in fat intake mean people were eating more vegetables instead of was refined carbohydrates, sugar, and flour. Such junk foods have become the staple of American cuisine. I hope you agree with me that if you wanted to create a nation of fat, tired, unhealthy people, this would be the perfect dietary plan. And that quote came from Dr. Robert Atkins in 2002, eight years ago. So was he right about things changing? Well, his words certainly had some impact. This is from the USDA's report on wheat. The decades-long growth in wheat consumption ended in 1997. Why do you suppose that is? As changing consumer preferences led by the adoption of low-carbohydrate diets reduced per capita wheat consumption. Per capita flour use dropped rapidly after 2000, then fell more slowly until reaching a low in 2005, a low from which it has not fully recovered. So we can have an impact. But here's what also happened. If I was a conspiracy theorist, but I'm not, but if I was, this would be a doozy of a conspiracy. What else happened? Oh, I don't know, around 2002, 2003, right as the USDA was figuring out, oh my gosh, people have stopped eating wheat and flour? Well, all of a sudden, this science appeared that said, the glycemic index is the way to figure out whether or not you're healthy food. And despite the fact that the glycemic index results are not reproducible from person to person, despite the fact that they don't actually relate to any way that people eat. Who sits down and eats 100 grams of carrots? <laughs> right? And then, and then you know, sees what the effect is on their blood sugar. And despite the effect, the fact that the glycemic index doesn't actually show, so if you eat low glycemic foods, doesn't show any effect on um, weight, on diabetes control, on um, lipids, none of that. Nonetheless, we've decided that using the glycemic index and um, the evil twin glycemic load to decide what's healthy has become the answer. This is what we've been learning <coughs> from science, the answer to the obesity crisis. So what's going on is that in the world of nutritional research, which I'm immersed in at a university, um, and I've become that kid, the, 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 the low carb kid in the corner going, ooh, 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 I know the answer, ooh, ooh. And the teacher looks all around the room wondering if somebody else has the answer and they'll call on that person because, ooh, ooh, they don't want to call on that deranged kid in the corner who always has the answer. And, and we do. So we need to be able to intensify our efforts to provoke the scientific community into recognizing that geeky kid in the corner. Because when low-carb diets are recognized, how are they recognized? They're attacked. And we get nonsense, um, I'm sorry, science, like the food paper. Is anybody here familiar with this? Uh, let, me, let me introduce you to the food paper. Uh, usually, if I just say the word food, that makes um, <laughs> Richard just spray his food all over the place. Um, the food paper is a mouse study. Um, and we all know how much mice are like people, where you take a genetically modified mouse that's designed to become atherosclerotic, and you feed it a high-fat, low-carb diet that would never eat in the wild, and when it develops atherosclerosis, you are amazed and stunned and horrified because, of course, it is that high-fat, low-carb diet that caused the mouse to become atherosclerotic, and therefore, of course, all humans are like mice, and we should start eating a high-carb, low-fat diet to protect ourselves. That's the sort of study that shows that low-carb diets are bad for mice, um, but doesn't say anything about people. So we need the resources, we need the funding to fight that sort of pseudoscience. 